the Genetic Literacy Project. Uh, John, you, you published your first book when? About 1999, is that correct? Yeah, right, right, January of 2000. Okay, and your first book was on a taboo topic, but it really grew out of an NBC News documentary that you did with Tom Brokaw. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about uh, your first book and that initial documentary project that you did with Tom Brokaw. Yeah, I um, was a television network news producer for ABC. Initial NBC documentary. News for many years, and, uh, including a, a long stint as Tom Brokaw's uh, producer. And one day he and I were in a friendly argument about why um, why so many American sports seem to be um, dominated increasingly so by by African American athletes, and and the world track and field scene had, uh, in terms of um, running, had almost been taken over by uh, Black Africans and uh, African uh, and Blacks of African descent. And um, I was claiming it was genetics, and he was saying no, it's you know the classic they're escaping the ghetto and uh, trying to. Um, overcome uh, cultural financial issues and obviously I thought there was an element of that but I had become convinced maybe as a failed college football place kicker um, that uh, uh, that uh, there was a, a genetic component to it and after much discussion um, he got management to overcome their reluctance and approve a, uh, a documentary um, called Black Athletes Fact and Fiction examining the genetic and the sociological arguments for it. And it was a huge um, success, uh, touched off a, quite an international debate, hundreds of articles, got us in some hot water because we dared to suggest that there were genetic hardwired differences between populations. Um, and, but I think it overall was constructive. And out of that came a book contract that led to uh, my book, Taboo, Why Black Athletes Dominate Sports and Why We're Afraid to Talk About It. And, really reflected my um, a dominant stream in all of my work, which is I like to take on subject matter uh, that, that's deeply um, rich and controversial, um, where I think that uh, political ideology, political correctness has been um, putting a cap on what we're allowed to say when these are really important issues. And in, in, in this case, the genetics of human differences is so important because so many diseases um, uh, affect one population more than another. So what might seem like a somewhat trivial debate over sports differences, even though sports obviously is a huge international um, phenomenon, it actually has deep medical and also uh, human relations consequences. So that's, that's the history of that and generally why I've taken up the mantle of, um, of taking on controversial subjects. Now, there's a widespread opinion that uh, anyone who works in television is like at best a mid-level IQ. But hmm. uh, be because the TV medium, of course, you're, you're aiming at a 100 IQ crowd on average, I would assume. But the, the people who are making TV are not morons. Uh, perhaps you can talk a little bit about the that misconception. Uh, when, when now you... Uh... <laughs> You damned an industry with faint praise, <laughs> actually. But st but I actually don't think that that's true. I think that uh, um, obviously there's a lot of junk on TV, but there's a lot of high quality stuff as well. Um, a lot of thoughtful documentaries. Uh, some some news people are among the smartest people I've ever come across. Um, it's not just showmanship. Um, to be a really good television news journalist um, at the highest level, you have to go through a winnowing out process um, where the... Um, the the lower IQs, if you call it, um, really, really get phased out. So I, I was um, excited to take on a controversial subject. Um, and uh, I think the, the fact that it was turned into a best-selling book and has led to uh, multiple books on, on genetics and, and human behavior, controversial books, but thoughtful, very well reviewed, and ultimately led to the founding of a, uh, my nonprofit which focuses on biotechnology and its impacts on everything from vaccines to gene therapy um, to GMOs and gene, gene edited crops. It's called the uh, Genetic Literacy Project, geneticliteracyproject.org. And it's a, it's a um, outreach and education group, but it also, it challenges misinformation by bad journalists, most of whom happen to be in print, I have to tell you. <laughs>
what are the skills that it takes to to work in network news? Well, it depends on what level you're operating at and, and, and where your focus is. I was a, a news producer, which unlike in the entertainment field, um, it means something different. Entertainment producers are the money bags, the, the people behind the scenes who kind of wire the original structure of a, of, of a, uh, of a project. The news producers are essentially the, um, the, the, the journalists who, who, who work the beat, who, who do the, uh, the gumshoe investigations or background. Uh, and it, I, I was involved in longer form pieces, working for 2020, Primetime Live, did long features for the NBC Nightly News for Tom Brokaw for many years. So we do a lot of background work, a lot of the um, uh, interviewing and, 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 and writing of it. So I found that very fulfilling. A lot of um, people think of, you know, Fox News talking heads or CNN commentators in, 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 in the evening or MSNBC as as a synonym for television news, but that's not, that's a, that's the blowhard section. Doesn't mean that there aren't small, smart people doing some of those things. Doesn't mean that um, you might not learn something from it, but that's, that's a different discipline than the hard news division that I grew out of. Uh, what about the effect of, of groupthink? Every occupation comes with groupthink. And one notices with journalism that with pretty much every major story, suddenly all the news outlets are approaching it with about the, the same emotional temperature. They've already kind of decided who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, and how we're going to cover this. Doesn't matter if it's NBC News, LA Times, they all come with the same, same sort of emotional approach to, to a story. So that's got to be a, a product of, of groupthink. So how, how every profession has groupthink. Uh, what, are the, what are some of the, the dangers of groupthink in in the profession that you were in and how did you escape from it? Well, I, I, I do think you're right. Um, there is a lot of um, uh, conformity, um, even when the journalists believe that they're being asking out of the box questions, they're asking it, with, with, usually asking those questions within rather narrow parameters. Um, I think I'm very liberal minded. Uh, I, I'm not a science denier, I believe climate change is the, the most pressing problem of our times. I might quibble over uh, what's the best way to address it. Um, but, you know, basically, I, I consider myself a liberal minded person. Um, certainly reject Trumpism, which is really frightening and, and autocratic and totalitarian. But I would, would say that there is a, um, a political correctness um, that, um, that uh, dominates uh, television um, news, but also journalism, mainstream journalism in general. Uh, and I think it's a, a, a liberal bias. Um, I, I think there's a, a, a main, a very um, important reason why, for instance, uh, mainstream journalists didn't anticipate Trump um, possibly even winning the election uh, in 1916, uh, 2016. I think they were out of touch with the vast majority of America, which tends to be a little bit less well-educated than perhaps journalists are, didn't go to elite schools, don't only socialize with people who take a fairly dogmatic liberal viewpoint. So there's n not enough room for heterodoxy. Um, I think I'm a heterodox by nature. Um, I used to have a column for Forbes magazine called The Contrarian, um, but I'm not a contrarian for the sake of being a contrarian. I'm, I'm a believer of a, of, a, of a Greek way of thinking called epoche, E-P-O-C-H-E, which is really, it's called framing. And you try to look at every new idea or um, fact and frame it and almost try to see it um, devoid of as many um, prejudicial inputs as you can. And when you start doing that, you come up with new views of, of what issues really are. And sometimes your views even make disconcert, disconcert yourself. I mean, I get disconcerted sometimes when, when, when I allow myself to follow the facts um, because sometimes I'm uncomfortable with, 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 with what the facts tell me. But I really have uh, come to believe that I'm willing to, you know, live in that world of hard knocks where you say what you believe is the truth, say it in a way that's not dogmatic, say it in a way that encourages um, conversation. Um, but I have to say that, as you, you rightly pointed out, I, I think there is a bit of a group think tends to be kind of liberal, except now there's a whole um, right wing um, echo chamber insular system from Fox News to other networks to an incredible online presence that in its own way is a juggernaut uh, equally as um, um, suppressive and sophomoric 
as the uh, knee-jerk left. So for an example of this, this group think, almost all the mainstream media journalistic coverage of how the Trump administration reacted to COVID was that it was incredibly incompetent when statistically there's really no difference between how the Trump administration and other industrialized nations reacted to COVID. But from the Washington Post to PBS and Frontline to the Los Angeles Times, they all reacted the same way. It, there was there was virtually no sense of an international perspective like, oh, let's compare how the United States is dealing with this compared to other industrialized nations, except in, in kind of narrowly drawn ways to make uh, the Trump administration look bad. And, and the countries that supposedly did really well among the industrialized nations with, with COVID, uh, they weren't doing anything different than the United States tried. It, it's not like New Zealand and Australia or, or Japan or, or Taiwan had these incredibly innovative techniques that the, the United States, you know, was just too bubbling and incompetent to try. So, one, do you grant my premise from what you read and saw of mainstream media coverage of how the Trump administration reacted to COVID? And two, if there's something to what I'm saying, how do you account for groupthink in the mainstream news media? Well, for, um, I agree with some of what you said, and, and I would take issue with a couple of things. I do think um, our... Uh, overall um, death numbers per capita suggest that we didn't handle it particularly well, though that is really dramatically skewed by New York City and the New York area region, which is, of course, um, took the most uh, restrictive measures. So I can't really hang New York's reaction and its bad situation on the Trump administration per se. Um, but overall, there, you know, many other countries did, did, did better than us. Um, but, but I think the problem with the Trump administration is its rhetoric and its um, its arrogance and and Donald Trump himself who who I, I've said this to other people there's some of his policies that I actually support um, in certain areas like in the areas of uh, biotechnology regulation for instance um, I thought Sonny Perdue was a very good Secretary of Agriculture and kind of let Purdue um, do what he do what he needed to do partly because it wasn't an area of political interest to, to Donald Trump um, but uh, his, his rhetoric was inflammatory. He divided people. You can't you can't escape the fact that 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 he's an arrogant SOB and, and, and in my mind unfit to have been president. That said, um, many of the policies that we instituted um, early on, including some of the things that he pushed, um, were were as um, reactive in a positive way as, as any place else in, in in the world. And as you said, there's a certain logic to a, to a, uh, a, a horrible logic to a disease that that is was uncontrollable to a large extent and the missteps were were as much done by trump as it was by the um international community which didn't understand um how diseases spread didn't understand the role that masks could play didn't understand um that lockdowns um should never have occurred on on children and younger people um our, our understanding of risk even today um, is, is skewed. And that continues because of this group think. It's been horrible. So, I mean, where I think there's a lot of legitimate criticism of Trump, there, there isn't in a sense of accountability um, in scaring people. And um, COVID is horrible. My daughter got it. I um, have experienced a, a, a friend of mine's 32-year-old um, daughter with no symptoms died of COVID. So I, I, it, it's a serious issue. But on the other hand, um, we, we could have managed it a lot a lot more smartly and some of the things that the Trump administration was suggesting in their own bubbling inept and in, in my case in, in, my, in my belief offensive way were actually probably um, would have been better be better choices o opening up earlier and focusing only on high, higher risk populations probably would have served our country a lot better than the um, than the way that the liberal intelligentsia to use a better word i'm uncomfortable a little bit about using that but really really had an agenda of their own what they thought was the best way um so i i, I basically agree with you with, with caveats this is a connected question even though it sounds disconnected how many people did you meet in the mainstream media who were pro-life in other words they regarded abortion as murder Um, I'm not sure I could say anyone for sure. Uh, I, I think I can. Zero. I mean, yeah. I've talked to all sorts of journalists who worked in the mainstream media. None of them can name one person 
who believes in, in a point of view that's held by approximately 40% of the population. And yeah, well, I'm not advertising for that point of view. It's just how dis how different from regular Americans journalists are, particularly at the elite level. Yeah, I, I, here, here, I, I agree with you, but, but I'll try to add a little bit of nuance to it. I don't have a problem with someone who is not pro-life um, or someone who is pro-life. I, I happen to be, I have reservations about abortion, but I'm, I'm generally speaking quite supportive of it. But I absolutely side with you on, the, um, on, on my disgust with people who believe that anyone who is pro-life is automatically a, a cretin and a, and a narrow-minded um, bigot. Um, because the people that I know, I mean, I'm sure there are people, people who fit that, but the people that I know who struggle with it, including my, one of my best girlfriends and, and, um, and boyfriends from growing up, who I introduced as 12th graders, and um, she ended up uh, getting pregnant the next year and came to me as a 19-year-old um, for, for my advice on, on whether she should seek an abortion. And I encouraged her to really reach in hard in her soul about what would be important to her. Um, and she and her husband-to-be decided not to have an abortion and had, had, has two wonderful kids. She was a kind of a poor working class girl who ended up becoming a nurse and got bored with it and then became a very wealthy anesthesiologist. And he was a Catholic kid, um, the oldest of 10, who had to move to California to go to college to support himself, ended up getting his PhD in electrical engineering. These are smart people and they're very liberal, liberal minded. I could say that they're no fun, no fan of, the, of, of Trump, but they are pro-life. And the fact that we can't have a public discussion and acknowledge that this is a richly personal and spiritual issue is a sign of the, I, I, I react curdle at the word cancel culture because I think the right uses it as much as the left, but this is an example of left, left wing group thing cancel culture, no question. Yeah, but my point is how unrepresentative elite journalists are. I have never spoken to an elite journalist who's been able to name one peer in elite journalism who's pro-life. So do you think that my my experience is, is not representative, and if it is even remotely representative, then uh, journalists obviously are absolutely nothing like the American people as a whole, which is fine, but it seems like an obvious point that should be acknowledged. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, you, you, you can't, you know, this isn't the, uh, this isn't, uh, e the GDR, this isn't East Germany. We can't say, you know, each year we want... Um, you know, 19,718 people to become journalists, and we're going to pick them from various demographic groups. It's like um, whoever wants to go in that profession is going to go in that profession. Um, there might be some selectivity out of people who have somewhat conservative viewpoints. I have no doubt management in various operations are prejudiced against people with a conservative point of view. I have no doubt that that's true. And, and, and ultimately, it could cost you your career, because I know out-of-the-box thinkers who are frankly not even conservative but have the, had dared to espouse views that are um, in, in conflict with a liberal um, mainstream viewpoint of things um, are, are excommunicated from the field. It is a, a fact that journalists tend to be hegemonically um, liberal and to some degree many of them, especially the not smart ones, um, rejectionist and contemptuous of people who don't share their worldview. So let's just say for the point of discussion that per capita COVID death rates in the United States were approximately in the middle of what other European uh, industrialized nations achieved. If, if I'm in the, the ballpark there, then the mainstream media coverage of America's response to COVID is just incredibly disjointed or out, out of touch with reality. I mean, I'm basically just building on, on analysis by David Wallace Wells in, in New York Magazine, but essentially is, he, he wrote a great piece, how the West lost COVID, how did so many rich countries get it so wrong? How did others get it so right? And essentially he makes the point that uh, per capita death levels in the United States are approximately the same as other European industrialized nations, but there was virtually never that sense of context in almost any of the news media coverage that I saw in the United States, it was all on how awful the United States is doing when that just does not seem to, 
to be true to reality. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think as you say, uh, raised earlier, there's the, the, dis, the dislike um, at, a, at a deeply visceral level of Donald Trump um, was so overwhelming that they were going to laminate defeat and, um, and humiliation onto him at any cost. And so I think that that tone is just infuses um, the news media uh, and uh, does affect their coverage. And again, Donald Trump is, in my mind, was contentious and was uh, a, a divisive figure that I think has done permanent damage to the American population. But um, what we learned, I think the COVID thing should hum humble anyone. It was something that no one could control. And actually certain measures that the U.S. took, um, for instance, I think pushing in some states, mostly Republican states, to open up, um, especially in schools and other places, actually were the smarter decision to make. I'm not sure they were made uh, for the right reasons. In some cases, I think that they were. In other cases, I think it was purely in, uh, a reaction to what they saw as the, the, the liberal take on things. But the fact is, is that this disease confounded everyone. And uh, the narrative that's been painted and has emerged and remains so today is heavily skewed um, against, um, uh, you know, Trump equals the United States view of the world. No question. How did you realize that uh, that uh, part of the reason that uh, certain athletes dominate certain sports is to do with genetics? How did you realize that in your discussion with Tom Brokaw? Well, I mean, I intuitively thought that might be the case when I was um, 19, 20 years old, I think I was, maybe right around then. Sports Illustrated came out with a, um, a seminal front page article on what, why are blacks coming to dominate sports. We're talking the early 1970s when um, at that point the NBA in 10 years had, had gone from 20 percent African-American black to 80 um, percent. To the NFL had gone from 10% black to 60, 65%. Um, baseball, if you include black Latinos, blacks represent 12% of the US population, 33% of baseball players has actually gone down since then, partly because baseball is now thought of more as a white sport and it doesn't, it historically been the black sport in, from the time of the Negro Leagues on, onward. Um, so I intuitively thought that that could play a role. I, I thought about it. Um, uh, and I am a curious type. I've always been a heterodox in whatever job I've been in. I think always a thoughtful one. I was prized at NBC because I was a, considered an out-of-the-box thinker and, and had the trust of Tom Brokaw and upper management. Uh, and they thought that I was going to give an original take on things. And sometimes they were surprised because... It contradicted what they thought I was going to do, say. And in, in this case, um, ultimately, Tom and I came together on this. And, and when, as we explored the evidence, it was somewhat rudimentary at that point. But what, what was one thing that was very clear, for instance, was um, that this is not really a black-white issue, per se. It's really about body types and, and uh, our ancestry. So you look at running. To me, that's the ultimate um, laboratory for seeing uh, differences uh, among populations, and you look at uh, speed running from, let's say, the 100 meters all the way through the 400 meters. Every single, um, every single world record, and it, the top two to 300 um, top um, uh, athletes are all of West African ancestry. In the case of the 100 meters, the top 2,400 100 meter running times are held by a person of West African ancestry. Yet there's not one West African. Um, not one in the world who's a who's an elite 800 meter runner and um, and longer. They are dominated by people of East African ancestry, Kenyans, Tanzanians, and there's not one. Um, I think that the best rated Kenyan 100 meter runner is like 4,600th ranked in the world. I mean, in other words, insignificant. You can't tell me that the Kenyan runners who love the pageantry and the lucrative payoff of becoming a elite level Olympic level long distance runner wouldn't wouldn't go after 100 meter um, uh, events, which take a far less training and toll on your bodies if, if they were if they could, but they can't because they don't have the body type for it. So I just found that the facts began to tumble out 
They were so overwhelming. And then the story morphed from, here's the story about the facts to now we're back to the situation with COVID and, and explaining it. Why are we afraid to talk about it? So I did original a documentary on the phenomenon and a little bit about the censoring of discussion about human differences, the controversy that discussing that racial, racially based human differences or population based to use a less charged term to writing a book um, 11 years later, 10 years later called Taboo, Why Black Athletes Dominate Sports and Why We're Afraid to Talk About It, which really was mostly about why we're afraid to talk about it. And we're afraid to talk about it because we can't have honest discussions without some form of political correctness and cancel culture um, stepping in. Um, and that's okay. We don't require that sports commentators tell every bit of context, but I'll tell you where it really matters is if you're a black and you need a, and you need a bone marrow transplant and you go to a hospital and they tell you, we can't give you bone marrow because the only bone marrow we have are from whites. And if we give it to you, it's going to be rejected by your body because people of African ancestry don't have the same histo compatibility um, uh, standards as as um, as whites do, and so these issues would go far beyond sports. Sports become an emblem uh, of, of 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 discussing human differences, and that's what fascinated me that we're actually willing to deny the the, the nose in front of our face. I guess most people in in the, the middle class don't like to talk about racial differences. And then there's a tiny group of people who don't like to talk about anything but racial differences, but they, they usually do it in a provocative and nasty way. How on earth did you pull off this simultaneous trick of being heterodox and working well with other people at elite levels? It's interesting. Um, the, the liberal um, the liberal magazine Slate wrote a very positive review of my book and, and, it's, and its general theme was, how was John Entine able to write a book like this, not lose his, uh, his, his, uh, his career, um, not get threatened with death when, uh, and they compared it to uh, an incident in the United States, uh, you may or may not recall. Jimmy the Greek. Jimmy the Greek Snyder, um, who was fired just for discussing in, in a fairly inelegant way, but still, in, in, a, in an honest way, he was not racist. He didn't have a racist bone in his body, I don't think. But he raised the idea that blacks and white, di black and white differences were, were, were rooted in the slave trade, which we don't believe at all is true. It's the, the uh, evolutionary differences go are hardwired over quite some time, 5,000 to 25,000 years of, of evolutionary differences. Um, but I was lucky. I don't know. I, I, because I think I was an honest broker. I mean, you can read, I have sections that talk about intelligence differences and I don't shy away from what the data says. So I, I remember giving a talk in Seattle once, you know, we're basically talking about Liberal Central and I was at, the, they have a very famous bookstore there. Maybe it was Portland, I think, Portland or Seattle. Anyway, same thing from a, from a liberal perspective. And, and as I was um, talking about my book, a, a white guy gets up and says, uh, you know, you're really racist. This is the idea that you're even suggesting that there could be hardwired black-white differences. You're just opening up the Pandora's box of racism. And um, I think you're really demeaning blacks. And so like two blacks got up together because they had been talking to each other and says, hold it, what is this white guy telling me as a black person what I should think about this issue? I've read his book. His book is one of the most honest, enlightened things that really provokes some deep thinking on me and reflecting about a lot of these issues. And you're the racist by trying to squelch this kind of thinking and discussion because he laid his cards on the table and he invited a discourse on this. And that's what we lack today. We really have a situation where there's a, almost like a programmatic left. It's very um, Stalin-esque. It's very GDR-like. Um, and it comes as much from the political left as it comes from the political right. The difference is the political left believes that they are purer than, than, than Snow White on these things. And they're not, they're, they're censorious and they're narcissistic and self-serving in some cases. Uh, didn't uh, Barack Obama read your book, Taboo? Um, there was one reference saying that he read the book, yes. Um, uh, and it was somewhat said, it was an interesting book, I think is what he, as far as he would go. Um, you know, it looked, I, I, I was on television, I was on, uh, CNN. I was on national public radio four or five times. Um, I did over 500 
TV and radio interviews, and there were more than 400 um, print reviews of the book. It was the most heavily reviewed book over a two-year period um, when it came out. So there was a chance to discuss these things, but it's so interesting because we've now regressed on the issue of talking about human differences back to the point that I don't think I could get that book published today, even though it was wild, widely endorsed by everything from Scientific American to Human Biology Magazine to the um, American Journal of Physical Anthropology. These are really high-end science journals that gave it glowing reviews, let alone the African-American columnist for the Washington Post, for the Hartford Current, Ebony Magazine. I mean, it just got great reviews, better than Stephen Jay Gould, who's a very controversial figure and considered one of the bright lights of, of, of genetic science. I mean, a lot of his books, I think, are, have some interesting points, but some say really ridiculous, politically correct things that are just unmoored from the facts. So I think I was able to navigate that ship fairly well, but I think I chose to be willing to face the world of hard knocks. I was willing to take fire. And I think once you're willing to take fire and are going to lay it out and you're not cutting the corners to ensure your politically correct ass, then, um, then I, I, I think people appreciated that. And I, I ended up coming, up coming out of it okay. And then you came out with a book in 2005 about Jews and genetics. What, what led you to that book and what were the challenges with that book? Yeah, it was actually a very funny t discussion with my um, agent saying, look, you have a really great book here. Uh, uh, this is in the first book, Taboo. Um, I, I really you know, think you should maybe consider doing another follow-up on genetics because you really know how to write about this in, in about inflammatory subjects in a way that keeps the flame burning for interest sake, but doesn't let it consume you and the subject matter. And I said, what, what, what should I do it on? I don't really know. And, um, right at that time, my sister had been diagnosed with um, breast cancer and it, she ended up being tested and found out that she has a genetic version of the breast cancer. It's called a BRCA mutation that traces back to her Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. And soon after, and my mother, my aunt, and my grandmother all died within one year of each other when I was in high school. And so um, as I was thinking about that, he said to me, you should do a story on, on Jews. I said, well, why Jews? He says, well, Jews buy books and they also get genetic diseases. It's the perfect match for you to do a story on it. So I, I decided that hmm, I want to do the same issue. Believe it or not, Jews were defined as a race and, and they actually defined themselves as a race up until World War II. It was just common descriptions. Jews would say that they were a race. It just the, the, the whole experience with the Holocaust um, and genocide um, linked to racial identity um, really, I, I think, um, um, for, for the first time ever historically, um, separated the, the connection between uh, Jews and race, though many people still think of the Jews as a population, as a people. And I thought this was fascinating. I want to explore this. And, and here there's a direct link to um, the, the potential benefits of understanding this because so many of our disorders, medical conditions, are linked to our race, are linked to our population ancestry. You don't have to use the term race, which is a very problematic term, as Taboo spent 350 pages talking about why the race term is problematic. But we do have human differences. And the fact is, if you're, if you're Jewish, you have a higher chance of getting a genetic disorder. My sister who got breast cancer ultimately died of genetic form of pancreatic cancer linked to her Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. So um, I was fascinated by that. And I was also fascinated by how, um, what distinguished Christianity and Islam from Judaism is that they unmoored religion from ancestry um, you, you talk about blood in the New Testament. Blood for Jesus and his disciples means faith. Blood in the New Testament and the Old Testament means blood. It's real and real thing. And I thought that's fascinating to see how um, uh, all religions were tribal religions until Jesus. And uh, except for, um, yeah, and the only surviving tribal religions today of note are um, are Judaism and Zoroastrianism. Um, all the rest are faith-based religions, and many Jews don't even realize that they're a, they're part of a um, uh, uh, something that's, that's as much about culture and history as it is about genetics itself. So I thought all these things made it fascinating to me. I, I'm an atheist, but I was raised Jewish. I um, majored in religion at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, 
Um, I, I really respect um, Islam and respect Christianity and thought that uh, the whole genetics uh, entree into talking about religion was a uniquely interesting way to talk about the same issues that I raised in Taboo. There's a lot of overlap and similarity between the two, though if you read them, they, they're totally different books, but that some of the themes are, are the same. How do we talk about human differences in a respectful way? I'm thinking part of the reason for your success in talking about human differences in a way that hasn't gotten you canceled is that you innately have grown up with and have mastered the rhetoric of the elite. I don't know anyone who's not elite who uses the word problematic. So you seem to have, you've naturally mastered the, the language of the elite. And so therefore they feel more comfortable hearing you discuss things. Do you think that's fair? I, I guess I'm, I'm not self-conscious of, of some of that. I think I am some, I, and some, I'm aware of that. But I, frankly, nothing pleases me more than sticking my finger in the eyes of, of um, liberal elitists. It's, uh, I mean, I, I work in the area of genetically modified foods, genetic engineering, um, gene edited crops. Um, and and I, I, I've spent a lot of my time over the past 10 years focusing on, on, on human related issues and COVID vaccine development and other things, but really on how you educate the people about a technology that is very progressive in the best sense of the uh, of the uh, of the word. We are really um, empowering the developing world um, to to deal with the effects of, of climate change and and to deal with the effects of, of less arable land and giving them control over their food destiny, which really means giving them control over their destiny. And and who's opposed to it? Crazy liberals um, who who like have swallowed the 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 the, 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 the myth of naturalism whole. Um, and so I, 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 although it pains me that those are my antagonists on a lot of these issues, n nothing is, is, is more fun than going after a, a hard headed, self-righteous, um, um, cancel culture promoting woke liberal. What is your IQ? I don't know. What was your GPA in college? I, I was just, a, I, I was a philosophy major, um, in philosophy, I was a 4.0, but in things that I didn't like, I, I had no problem with getting a, a, a B or B minus and things I didn't like. But that's not important. I, I think what I, I don't think that I'm necessarily the highest IQ. I think I'm in the low 130s, to be honest, uh, from, from what I can tell based on my SATs and things like that. I, I think some of this is really, do you think out of the box? And that's not, a, that's somewhat of an IQ thing, but it's really a sensibility thing. I really do believe my whole life even as a little kid, I was always um, the one who thought a little bit differently. I, I went to, I grew up in a, um, a, a fairly affluent upper middle class community, very liberal. Um, and I remember I was uh, in first grade, I don't know what, nine years old, something like that. And our teachers, uh, it was an election between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. And um, the teacher said, who, who let, let's hold a class election, you know, like eight years old. I, I didn't know policy from salami. I mean, I didn't know anything about this. So who, who are you going to vote for? And there was 26 kids in the class, 25 voted for John Kennedy. I voted for Richard Nixon. I ended up loathing Richard Nixon 10 years later. And I was a true blue Democrat uh, in, in large ways. But at the time, I just wanted I, I couldn't believe if all these people want one person, then they can't be there's, there's a flaw here. Because that's the way autocracy, and you know, now I would use these words, that's the way autocracy works. I can't believe in group think like that. So I'm voting for the underdog. And I think I've had that sensibility all the time. And at times it gets me in trouble. Um, but I think um, overall, uh, getting back to that framing technique called FOK, I try to look at each situation and be fearless about where the facts take me. Um, and I try to do it on everything. And I'm, I have usual bedfellows as a result of that. I, I've been a member of the, one of the more, I would say, moderate conservative think tanks, the American Enterprise Institute, but also one of the most liberal think tanks, the World, World Food Institute out of the University of California, Berkeley. Um, so, uh, to, and, and I'm good friends with Charles Murray, controversial writer of the bell curve, who, and I share a lot of his uh, very informed views on a lot of issues, but I have, um, I work with the Aspen Institute and, um, and on, on as a, almost a classically far left or moderate, moderate left organization in promoting 
alternative viewpoints. What, what they all share, what Charles Murray and the Aspen Institute both share, they're willing to think out of the box. Um, and, and they're not just hegemonic, knee-jerk um, liberals or conservatives. What were your SATs? Um, my SATs were, I don't know, 15, 20, something like that combined. And were you higher in verbal or math? I was higher in um, math, much higher in math. Um, I, my, I was, didn't have any intentions of being a writer, and I didn't have much confidence in my writing abilities. Um, and then I went through a transformation. I wanted to be a political science major. I dropped out of college. To give you an idea of my liberalness, I dropped out of college to work for George McGovern um, and, and, and run a county for him in New Hampshire in the 1972 election. Um, and, but I went through a transformative spiritual awakening that didn't ultimately draw me to religion, but it drew me to spirituality and it drew me to question um, how I view the world. I had a fairly non-nuanced view, I think, of, of, of religion. I don't think I was nearly as open-minded as for people who share, who had views that were different from mine, other than my human impulses. From an intellectual point of view, I was fairly crusted over. If I had become that person, I wouldn't be friends with my, that person now. And I just became, I love, I, I became attracted to philosophy and the philosophy of religion because it basically is about asking questions. It's not always about the answers. And, and you're rewarded as a philosophy major, a religion major, in how refined and thoughtful your questions are, not what your answers are. And I became, to me, that was a transformative, that changed my brain. It literally changed the structure of my brain. So I, what I, I remember reading things that I had read two years before, and it took on an entirely different meaning. Um, and things that I thought were ambiguous were really about how cool they, they changed perspectives. So I became um, a, a lover of Socrates and, um, and Plato, because that was really a lot about questioning and, and was somewhat disdainful of Aristotle. Now, actually, in my older age, I'm much more Aristotelian in my viewpoint, because I want to actually get things done, not just debate them. But it was just interesting how um, I think that that inquisitorialness, that's what's missing in journalism today. It seems like, and you, you pointed this out, I think rightly so, they start out with a conclusion and then find the facts to, um, to reinforce that conclusion rather than keep an open mind and letting the facts dictate where they go. Uh, at what age did you have this transformative spiritual experience? Uh, at what location and what was the experience? It was when I was... Um, uh, I, I dropped out of college during my sophomore year as things were percolating in my head. I had done a little acid dropping and that I'm, I'm of that generation, although I wasn't, I probably only took acid five, five or six times, smoke a little bit of marijuana, did not use any um, pills because I thought pills were anti-mind stimulating. They were all about body experiences. Not that I'm even now that I'm more, uh, much more, much less judgmental about that. But at the time, I was really in interested in mind stuff. And I, and, and I spent, um, I probably read like every book that Freud ever, not in probably, I read every book that Freud ever wrote. I even ultimately got into um, psychiatry graduate school, never having taken a, psychi a psychi psychology class in my entire um, time at college, because I thought psychology, as it was taught, was one of the I call it one of the gutter subjects. Sociology was the bottom of the bottom of the heap. Psychology was not much better than that um, in terms of the seriousness. It was more like writing sophisticated novels in my mind, but it did open my mind to think in different ways. I mean, I, one week I was more Freudian in my mind. Another, another week I maybe apply Hegelian philosophy to psychological issues, um, you know, all kinds of things. And it was really, I think, a period from my sophomore year to my um, uh, into my junior year that began a change in the structure of my mind and the way I asked questions and the way I looked at the world that has became, has served me well. And I think I've actually um, matured in that over the years. And I find there's a, a whole community of heter heterodoxical think thinkers. There's a, there's a website you may have heard called Quillette. Yes. Um, with some people call it, oh, this is a conservative website. It's the opposite of a conservative website. It is the most liberal website when you use the term liberal correctly. It's a liberal-minded website that where no question is, is, um, is out of bounds for them as long as the, as long as the writer is willing to um, challenge it and, and, uh, in, in a thoughtful way. And that's, that's my community right there. I, I, love, I love that place. And I think that that's what we need more of. 
um, people who are willing to go where the evidence takes them, even if it ends up overturning their own prejudices that they build over years and years of a belief system. They have to be willing to change. Okay, let me let me push you again to to answer the, my question. What what was yeah. the date of your transformative spiritual experience? Like, what was the the month? What was the year? And what was the place? Oh, uh, it happened mostly, I think, in New Hampshire. I I had, like I said, I dropped out of college to work for George McGovern. When the campaign was over, I briefly went home, got a construction job, and then decided I really loved New Hampshire and I wanted to spend the summer there. I got a a job in it's, it's 2000, uh, 1973. I got a job, uh, 1972 rather, uh, at, a, at, an, at an inn working as a helper. And I got the top floor where I was and had about 60 books. So I read every one of them. I was reading a book or, book or three a week. And I think that summer is when I came to a, a realization that I, I think differently about the world. Changed my college experience. I was a mediocre student bumbling by and suddenly whatever I wanted to get an A at, I got an A at because my mind was different. It actually absorbed information like a sponge. And before I was like in a hand-to-hand -hand combat with information. And it was so great. You were 20 years of age. Yeah. And so you'd been in college for two years at this point? Two years, yes. And what were the drugs that you take at the, the played a role in this transformation? Well, the, I hadn't taken drugs in a year by that point. The drugs I took were really my freshman year. Um, and so it's, drugs didn't play any real role in, in that other than it started me on the process of, of, um, of, of I think, questioning a, a bit more. So I, I think I, the last drugs I took were probably the summer before, and I was, had done no marijuana, no acid, nothing. Um, but the, but the, um, the overturning of my worldview began, was seeded the year before with, with drugs beginning to fracture some of my, um, I, don't think, I don't think I had a worldview so much. I was just an unreflective person. <laughs> Um, I, I only realized how much I, um, I didn't have a worldview is what was what the realization was. And I, and I, and I didn't need a worldview where everything fits together. I need a worldview that's by its very nature was about dialogue, dialogue in your brain, dialogue with ideas, challenging things in a respectful way and always being open to learning and learning from people who you thought you didn't agree with. I remember um, what's, one thing that started this was the year before when I was coming down from an acid trip. It might have been the last time I took acid. Um, and I was in a park in Denver. I had hitchhiked out to Denver with a friend of mine. We were going to a conference in Aspen. We had organized these things called Walks Against Hunger in our community and raised $100,000 in, in my freshman year in college for, the, for these um, benefits. Uh, and I, as I was coming down from my acid trip, if you know anything about how acid works, it's kind of a weird disassociated period where you're kind of connected to reality and not. And I got kind of um, um, challenged by someone who was a Jesus freak. And I was, you know, I was a Jewish kid who rejected religion. And the idea of, of adopting Jew, uh, Christianity as my religion was, would have been an anathema to me. And I said, John, you're, you are in the beginnings of a journey. You have to open your mind up to any way of thinking if it's credible and it really resonates. That's what you want. That's the kind of person you wanted to be. So I was already on that path. And I said, I'm now going to explore. This is what turned me into being a religion major. I, um, I'm going to explore Christianity in a, in a respectful way rather than, a oh, who, who can possibly believe that Jesus was resurrected? It doesn't make sense. I'm dismissing this religion out of hand. And so it, it, it set me on a path of questioning probably my deepest prejudices that, that I thought of Christianity as... Um, Un, as an unbelievable concept. Um, it didn't ultimately matter whether Jesus had to have been resurrected and the truth of Jesus's life. If we all know any, anything about Christian history, and I talk a lot about it in my book, um, Abraham's Children, Christi, e, Christianity easily could have evolved in a different way where Jesus was a prophet. That's what the Alexandria wing of, of, um, of, uh, of, of the early Christian movement wanted. They didn't see Jesus as the son of God. They saw him as a prophet. Then there was the uh, the the other wing, which is driven by um, uh, the more yeah. conservative factions, and ultimately the conservative factions won, and the the idea of Jesus as prophet was um, relegated to the dustbin of history. So anyway, that was the I was challenged emotionally, spiritually, everything. That, that was the well, beginnings of it. What was the name of the inn that you worked at in New Hampshire? The Lime Inn, L Y M E. It's ten miles north of Hanover. 
And how long were you dropped out of college for? You took I, a semester, a year? And one of the reasons I went to the Lime Inn is because it was right near Dartmouth, and I ended up um, taking summer classes at Dartmouth and essentially caught up with my, um, with my class. So I ended up graduating on time. So you took a semester off, is that? I took a semester off and then, and then did a, a summer school to, to catch up. Did the experience of sex have a transformative effect? Of sex? Yes. I assume that I'm, you had sex in college, I, and that often changes people. No, I was fairly conservative. I don't think I had intercourse till my um, till my second year, probably m much w well behind others. So um, hopefully, I made up for lost time. But uh, I don't think that was a an issue in my trans transformation about how I viewed anything. No. But but it happened right before your transformation. Um, no, it happened in the middle of it, I would say. I don't think there's any relationship, frankly. Okay, interesting. Uh, who was the first person to notice your transformation? Uh, it was pretty profound. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I actually, there, there'd be, uh, you could see my whole demeanor had ch changed, and I, every, everybody around me, I, when, I went, when I came back to college, um, uh, after having been out for a semester, in other words, I left in, whatever, December of 1971 and came back in September of 1972, everyone saw that I was, um, had, had changed a lot. I, I felt more confident and so, suddenly I also had a ton more friends as a result of this, but I was not, I didn't feel I have to prove anything anymore. I felt really confident in my own skin. I think for the first time in my life, I, I think a lot of us go through identity crises and a sense of self-discovery in college. That's thankfully I had the opportunity to do that. I didn't have to work during college. I did. I had a full-time job my freshman year, working 20 hours a week um, in television, <laughs> writing and editing and producing the 11 p.m. news for the local NBC station. So I was very involved in in television journalism for a long, long time. Um, but yeah, it, it was very transformative. And um, but you I, don't remember the first person who noticed that you transformed. You Not have really. this profound inner experience, then the first person who notices, I, I would think that you might re remember that because now you're realizing that what you're experiencing is really shining out. Well, I could tell you that within a, within a month of coming back, I, I developed a, you know, a, an amazing relationship with a woman who was, became my college girlfriend and um, was, was the first adult, you know, post, post high school uh, adult like romance of my life so yeah that was pretty profound she she knew me beforehand she would sound like she didn't like me but but she suddenly saw all these qualities in me but part of that is just getting to know someone so i think that was probably the most profound profound was there thing. anyone in your teens or 20s who had a pretty good inkling of the direction of your life perhaps sharper than you did at the time yeah i think so i, I had a really good friend um who was 10 years older than me he was a out of the box thinker, a guy named David Gelber, who became quite famous for a lot of his documentary work, worked for 60 Minutes. When I met him, he was, um, he was just beginning to work in TV as a producer, but he was in his 30s. I was in my 20s. He had done a lot of political action stuff. He'd been involved as uh, part of the hippie, hippie activist social justice movement of the 1960s. Um, and uh, I found him really a really interesting guy. Um, and, a, and, a, and an out-of-the-box thinker as well, and I think we bonded. Um, he, like I said, he was 10 years older. I didn't think it was a, a mentor relationship. I think it was two close friends. He respected me, and I respected him, but he was very influential, I think, in, in my formative years. So he saw a direction? I mean, what did he see? What did he say? Where, where did he say you were going? Well, he just saw me as a, someone who was really cared about journalism in the fullest sense of the word. That's really what it is. I'm, I, I don't I'm a little uncomfortable in, in some of the directions we're going in because I'm not that special. I'm a, uh, there's a lot, a lot of people who are, who think independently. Um, and I just am lucky enough that, that the things that I uh, am writing about are ones that have, uh, are, are in the popular consciousness right now, popular debate. So I'm going to do my, my best to um, create a, a genuinely constructive discussion 
around issues that have historically been taboo. And I don't mean the black white differences so much. I, I mean, even, you know, I have no problem calling out Trumpites in, in my in, in, uh, the genetic literacy project, but I have no problem calling out the political correct, correct, correctness that infects the left either. So one day I'm, I see tweets saying, oh my God, the GLP, did they lose its soul? And the next day I said, wow, that was an amazing takedown of those awful whatevers. And I think that's what we want to be. We want to, wherever the facts take us, you know, take no prisoners and ultimately hope people will respect you for your honesty and integrity, even if they don't agree with you. I often mentioned how, how liberal you are. I, I assume that you mentioned this as a reflex because pretty much everyone in your most people in your social circle or social class regard being liberal equals good person. And so I just noticed this, this reflex in your, in your rhetoric. Am I touching on anything important? Well, I, I, I think I have a great respect for conservatism. I just don't have a respect for Trumpism. I think Trump, Trump, Trumpism is a disease and um, it's, it's, it's a real rejection of things that I believe in. I'm a free thinker. I'm a classic free thinker. Classic free thinkers embrace conservative ideas as well as liberal ideas. I have no problem to say that Ronald Reagan, although I didn't agree with everything that he did, was a great president because he, 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 he pushed back in a thoughtful way against excesses. And that's, that's my kind of thinker. And I don't have to agree with everything that he said. So I, I deal in a lot of circles where there's a lot of conservatives. And I know the difference between a faux conservative one who's just a, a, a liberal rejectionist versus one who's actually like, like Charles Murray, for instance, who, uh, or, or people at Reason Magazine, which is, a, 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 I, I would say, a moderate conservative or libertarian modest right viewpoint where they're great friends of mine and I embrace a lot of their viewpoints on things. And a lot of the positions I take, I'm very pro-fracking because I'm concerned about climate change. I'm very nuclear energy because I'm concerned about climate change. And I think these are two two incredibly important tools in the toolbox. And, and I, um, although I support um, uh, innovation in solar and wind and alternative um, energy projects, I'm not foolish enough to believe that, um, that we can abandon uh, fossil fuels, um, not only for um, environmental reasons and economic reasons, but for um, geopolitical reasons. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're, all my friends are, are conservatives, not liberals. But I, but what I, I think what I hate about the Trump administration and Trumpers, a lot of them, is that they that they are illiberal in the same way that a lot of liberals are illiberal. So I'm not afraid to call it out. But I am, you know, generally speaking, um, I, I'd say yeah, I'm a Trump rejectionist, but I'm not a, um, I wouldn't call myself a liberal. But I, you know, for better or for worse, I use the term filled with all these caveats that go along with it. How did you assemble your book on, on Jews and genetics? I mean, you must have been delving into a lot of academic material and you don't have a PhD in genetics. So who do you know who to trust when, say, you've got competing geneticists saying opposite things? Well, I, I think actually, um, I mean, if you go on Amazon reviews, for instance, I don't know, there's been 105 reviews. I think 90 of them are five-star reviews. Um, it's not, wasn't nearly as controversial in, in its own way. It was deeply, con, con, uh, um, deep, deeply out of the box, but it's disguised in, 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 in a historical wrapper. Um, a lot of what I tried to do was tell the history of the three Abrahamic religions, um, through the prism of genetics, um, and then had a lot of side subjects as a result of that. So a lot of it was just understanding history it was reading um, the Quran and reading the Christian Bible and aspects of the, of, of the Jewish Bible and, and uh, the Torah um, uh, for the first time and reading it through and trying to understand it. And then I, you know, it's like I did with Taboo. I, I literally talked to hundreds and hundreds of, um, of, of experts in the field, some of whom were academics and some of whom were not. And, 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 and really, I have, a, I have a great confidence. I don't think it's arrogance in being able to weigh and distill ideas. Uh, I definitely have a narrative in those, and I don't, but I don't find people challenge the narrative, but I'm very transparent in the narrative. You can feel what I'm saying and, and, and how I back it up. And, and when I'm taking a position on something, I lay it out there. I don't try to pretend that I'm not taking a position. 
so it was easy with, with, with that, with my attitude, I had no problem finding um, heterodoxical thinkers uh, among the religious world, among ethicists and in, in, in other areas. It was fun. I rarely do you learn so much in writing something. Um, I learned a lot. I mean, I had read the freaking major religious tomes of, of, of Western civilization. It's an abomination. I really think the world would be better if everybody was required to, to do the great books series for their first year or two in college. Everybody should read stuff going back from, um, you know, the, the, the Greek and Roman periods all the way through today and probably sprinkle it in with some more politically correct things of today. But that would that would shape people's minds and open them up to to, to different viewpoints, because I think we this this um, cancel culture, political correctness that has taken over academia and infected the, the national news media is is, is so um, anti-liberal, really, when you come down to it. It's, it's, it's fake liberalism. It's actually autocratic. And it's, um, you know, the, 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 there is a line between here and Orwell if, if, we don't, if we're not careful. So you mentioned that you're able to find heterodox thinkers. Well, what happened in, in your research when you found heterodox thinkers on one side and anti-heterodox thinkers on the other? How were you able to, to judge that? Because if, if, if you had a chance to read the books, a lot of what I ask are, here are the different dimensions of it, and here's why I'm choosing um, this, th th this line of thinking. In other words, I, 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 it wasn't a polemic, it was a discussion. And that's a really different way of writing a book. Um, so you, you will understand the, the multiple sides of an issue in reading the book, no matter what, where I go. It's not like I selectively, it's not an ideological treatise. It's not like reading the crap that's generated by the, uh, you know, by the, by, by the far left in, in, in journalism today, or even discussing things like GMOs or vaccines or whatever. Um, it's, it's discussing all the points of view. I'm not afraid to, to, to guide people towards a viewpoint that I support, but it's done transparently so they understand. They, two, two, people can read what I've written, I think, and disagree with me, but be respectful of the fact that I ha actually helped lead them to a different perspective on it because I provided enough of the um, enough of the texture and context to make that happen. And what led you to start the Genetic Literacy Project? Um, I've been writing about genetic issues. Um, I've been holding a lot of conference conferences on it. I started a sustainability consultancy called um, uh, ESG Media Metrics, Environmental, Social, and Governance. I was very influential, I think, in getting involved in early ways to look at what sustainability really means. I actually um, uh, coined the term greenwashing as it's currently used. There was a version of it before I started using it. And I, I coined it going after the far left, uh, supporting um, I, what was called the corporate social investing movement, um, which really rejected uh, big business and, and, and um, glorified small businesses like the Ben and Jerry's and the body shops of the world. I thought that was incredibly simplistic. I thought their, their hearts were in the right place, but their minds were not. And um, that's why I coined the term greenwashing because these, it's now used as a term to describe large corporations would do it, but I use the term and it's the first time in circulation. Um, and I've been credited by a number of places as well um, for applying it to small up and coming um, uh, organizations that in their minds were doing the right thing. But if you actually examine their practices, some of them were haywire and, and, and wrong. So I had been writing about that for years. In 2001, I became a columnist for a magazine called Ethical Corporation, um, which I was allowed, I was their chief columnist and their most read person. In fact, I did a conference this morning with the founder of that magazine. Um, on sustainable, how to bring sustainability to the wine industry. And I was the one who basically said we have to um, scrap um, ideological terms like organic and regenerative agriculture and agroecology. Those are just marketing buzzwords with no content and therefore no, no science credibility. If we are genuinely concerned about sustainability, which has its own definitional problems, to be honest, um, you know, we have to get outside the uh, ideological box. So I was writing about agriculture. I was writing about sustainable, the sustainable world. And I was still 
in the afterglow of, of my book on Jewish genetics and, and, um, and Jewish diseases, and also the afterglow of um, my book Taboo, which is still in print and still sells a couple thousand <laughs> um, copies a year. So it was kind of um, everything came together. I started writing some articles and I was actually approached by um, two foundations who knew of me because I had no idea of how to even start a nonprofit. And one was the Templeton Foundation, which, which really is fascinated by the intersection of, of religion in a non-dogmatic way, Re religion meaning religious feelings, spirituality, not necessarily Christianity, Judaism, Islam. So, uh, so they saw me as a very interesting person who combined those two worlds. Uh, and also um, the Searle Foundation, which like the Ford Foundation, doesn't just support things involving the auto industry. It's a foundation founded by the Searle family, but supported a wide range of causes. And they both encouraged me um, to start. And I think I got $175,000 grant the first year for to pay for my salary and to hire a, a, a staff. And I started writing and then really kick, kicked it up a notch around 2015 or so. Uh, and I've really been found it very um, rewarding to push against windmills perhaps, but uh, um, to challenge uh, uh, popular thinking on uh, things like um, genetics and disease and things like genetics and agriculture. Would uh, one way of understanding your work over the past two, three decades is that you're a translator for abstract researchers and you're taking their work and making it understandable for regular people? I think that's perfect. That's, uh, that's definitely that and the out of the box, you know, thinking in a contrarian way about what a lot of other people thinks are, are settled viewpoints. I think those, those, you captured between those two things, you would have captured what, what I'm all about, what I care about. And I mean, just take an example, I think to most people, organic means good. And I think to most academics in, in a related field, they say the word has no meaning. Is that fair? It, it, it both has no meaning and has, it has a, it has a rigid ideological meaning. I, I, I mean, I say to people, um, you know, we, do you think communicating by telegraph should be required because that is, that is the best way to communicate with, with, with uh, dots and dashes and telegraph machines. And they look at me like, you know, we're far beyond that. We went to the telephone and then we went to the internet and now we have all these amazing ways to communicate. I say, Hmm, isn't it interesting in, in, in communications, we have evolved over the past hundred years, yet we embrace as superior, technology in agriculture that's 100 years old, wouldn't it be true that although some, some of the ideas in organics might be of interest and might inform us in a certain ideological way, like soil health is an important thing, that one of the main tenets of, of organic agriculture, the, its practices are kind of harebrained from a, from a 20, 2021 viewpoint. And when you start looking at it that way, you realize it's an ideology. It's not a. It's not a. Uh, it's not a set of principles. It's. A, it's. A, it's. A, it's. A, it's. It's a way of thinking. It's. It's really. It's. It's kind of very. Orwellian, you know, uh, out there groupthink. Um, the, the main thing that came out of the conference I did today, uh, and there were two wine growers there, uh, one in from France and and one from, um, and one from Germany, and both of them were like, this guy knows what he's talking about. We. As far as they're concerned, they have to be out in the real world, um, and they, they think, although they, they try to get organic status certification on some of the things they do, they do that because that's the ideological world they live in in Europe, but they hate it. They think it's gone off the rails, and they think that we should be focusing on what are the best solutions. It doesn't matter if it comes from the organic world or if it comes from conventional agriculture and, 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 and the application of biotechnology. We're all about solutions and organics uh, and agroecology, another, another new bu buzzword, and frankly, even the word sustainability, if you're not careful, are, are, are really about imposing um, a, a set of standards which were formulated 100 years ago. And that's the definition of insane, really. I have a lot of friends who think that which is natural is good. And I don't even know how to begin to deal with what seems to me an a generally absurd position 
Uh, how do you deal with this mindset that that which is natural is good and that which is artificial, like COVID vaccines, is therefore bad? Yeah, I mean, I was going to use the cor corona. Therefore, coronaviruses are good, and 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 all the vaccines, which are all biotechnology based, are bad. Um, you know, basically, if they're that locked into that kind of thinking, there's there's no way around it. They're just lost souls. Um, but you know, I always say, you know, oh, good, I'm going to make you a listeria burger, and you tell me how good natural is. I'm going to make you um, a little um, E. coli salad. And you tell me how good that is. Every year, according to Wikipedia, not necessarily the most reliable source, over 200 people die from, um, uh, from food poisoning from, na from natural and organic products in the United States. How many people have died in the history of, of the world from biotechnology in, in agriculture? It's a big, big round zero. And we're talking, and, we're, and when I say the 200, that's in the United States alone. So, you know, the, the myth of naturalism, it's, it's a religion. Naturalism is the pagan religion of our times promoted by liberals is what it is. And it's sad. It's also embraced by many conservatives as well, to be honest. Um, organics is so overwhelming a subject that you have um, or, or organic fanatics among the, among the right as well as you have among the left, even though it's more among the left, no question. I have an impossible time feeling sympathy for those who advocate that uh, mainstream vaccines, say for, for adults, should, should not, not be taken. I, I, I can't sympathize with that perspective. I think the, the anti-vax perspective is absolutely insane. Uh, how do you look at uh, anti-vaxxers? It's fascinating what's, what's going on. The anti-vax movement was primarily a liberal movement um, about three or four years ago, they, uh, I think it was um, um, Pew did a, did a survey on wh which were the counties in the United States that were most anti-vaccine in terms of based on, their, on some voting patterns on various things. And out of the top five, four were around San Francisco collar counties, all extremely liberal, like 80% Democrats. Um, and, and one was the Jewish Orthodox community in Queens. Um, which is not liberal, um, but but it's just as rigid minded. I mean, it shows that the what 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 links the Jewish Orthodox community and the um, liberal community in the collar of San Francisco is that they're both rigid rigid thinking people. So um, it, it became a philosophy. You know, your your admission into the liberal party was to um, uh, was to say that you 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 think everything should be natural and vaccines were obviously not natural. And so therefore it's, it's something of suspicion. It obviously became a, a favorite of the Hollywood crowd. It became a favorite of, of, of really one of the most sad stories of the past 50 years in terms of how, how low and far and unmoored a person can go. But Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is a vaccine denial par excellence, but he also has rich as hell. So he finances anti-vaccine movements. But the, what's so interesting is the moment that, um, uh, Trump became the symbol of, of uh, vaccine rejectionism. You don't hear a peep from the liberal anti-vaccine community, um, except for some you do. Some of the, some of the, very few, but so much more muted because vaccine rejectionism is now called, is now associated with Trumpism. And if you're pro-vaccine, you're really pro-biotech, bioengineering. I mean, what makes those that every single one is a different type of bioengineering, whether it's the Moderna um, mRNA or Pfizer mRNA or the, or the more traditionally biotech version ones of it. It's, and it's, it's like um, insulin, which is biotech created. It's, it's a application in the medical field of biotechnology. But the, the same way you create a, a biotech crop is the exact same way you create a biotech vaccine in, 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 the, in its earliest stages. So now anti-vaccination has become associated with Trumpism. Um, and it is to a large degree, but frankly, it has its roots in, 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 in the knee jerk delud delusionary world of the, um, of, 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 uh, of the liberal elite. Uh, now, I also have friends who think if you live in the city, you're useless and that all good people live in the country. I guess this is another aspect of that, which is natural is great. And that, which is unnatural is bad. I don't know if you encounter this kind of thinking. I don't know even where to begin. I don't think people are inherently good or bad based on whether they live in the city, the suburbs or the country. 
No, I think there's a difference in terms of education levels. The city tends to be a magnet for more educated people, but education can only take you so far. And there are also plenty of educated people that live outside the city and plenty, plenty of lo- people with a less education that, that are, live in urban areas. So we are, we're talking about tendencies there. And, and look, no one has a patent on stupidity. It, it, it happens in all ideologies. Um, I, I just wish we didn't have this uh, um, political fascism coming from the uh, political left. Um, and, and we didn't have Trumpism, which to me is um, dangerous anti-intellectual um, anarchy. And they, 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 they're two peas in a pod. It's, 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 it's a shame. Now, your, your comment section uh, policy, are people allowed to make the, the case against vaccines in the comment section of the Genetic Literacy Project? We, we allow anything where they're, they're, they're citing real sources. But if, they, if, they, if they're linking to junkscience.com, uh, we'll, we'll delete it. In other words, if they're linking to, uh, they, they link to, um, um, you know, Dr. Joe Mercola, who's an anti-vaxxer, we're not going to allow that on our site, no. But we will someone who has a coherent argument, and if they have the rare opportunity to, to link it to something that is coherent, we, we put it on. I, I, I was criticized two days ago because I uh, ran an article um, that appeared in Scientific American, but it really embraced the far left rejection of, um, of conventional agriculture. And I didn't agree with the article at all, but I did read the study. And although I didn't agree with the interpretation of the study, I thought it was well done and transparently presented. And so I decided, although I didn't agree with this conclusion, it really graded against me. I felt it's our obligation to our readers to present heterodoxical viewpoints. Again, even ones that I um, don't support if they're well articulated. And I got a lot of blowback. Um, so, some, some, some former ally of mine, it may still be, I don't know, but said, you know, is, is he, is, is who's he been hijacked by? Is he now getting um, seed money from the organic industry? You obviously know I never care about the organic industry, but it's just amazing. People are so much in their silos that they're afraid of other ideas. You don't have to agree with something. To, to try it on for size, um, because sometimes it ch- begins to change, if only on the fringes, your viewpoints. So that's what I subscribe to. And I think I've infused my staff with that commitment. What are the standards for what appears on your genetic literacy project? Good journalism. I mean, I think it's what, you know, if I want to get an article in Slate, I've had maybe four or five articles in Slate toned by the Washington Post. What are the standards? It's, if an editor likes my article and approves it, it gets in. If an editor doesn't like it, it doesn't get in. I, I have a staff, and if, if we like the articles, uh, based on the principles I've articulated, and I, we, we try to be honest brokers, we don't always agree, but then we have a con- try to reach a consensus ultimately, it, it gets in. I mean, you can't, say, can't predict ahead of time. You have to see how someone executes a story. Uh, has modern agricultural practices increased or decreased the nutritional value of food? Both. I think um, the commoditization of, of, of food um, and processed food has definitely degraded nutritional values. Uh, you know, we don't eat as, as much fresh or fresh frozen. Is just Fresh frozen is actually better than fresh in m- many cases because you, you freeze in um, nutrients at a certain point and they don't, um, and they don't deteriorate. For instance, although frozen food, frozen vegetables are considered processed food, they're actually more nutritious than most, uh, fresh vegetables, because by the time the fresh vegetables, you buy them, bring them home and then cook them, they've lost more nutritional value, which was actually frozen, locked in when you, when you freeze it. Um, so again, that's heterodoxical to say that, but if your interest is the highest value nutrition, Sometimes that kind of processed food is a, is, a, is a better choice. So, yeah, overall, we eat more junk food. We, we drink things like um, Diet Coke, um, and that, it's not, not so good for you. So, yeah. Um, that, Wait a that, second. Di- diet sodas. I mean, I don't think there's anything that's been as exhaustively studied as diet soda, and it just does not seem to be any strong evidence that this is bad for you. No, I think the only thing that might be bad for you is that it, it – it, 
It does a little trickery on your um, insulin levels and, and also on your, uh, your, um, your brain's ability to, 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 to feel satisfied. So there's some, some fragmentary evidence, which I think I'm, I'm pretty persuaded by actually, that if you drink a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of diet, it actually, you don't necessarily, you, you make it up by eating uh, fat, more fattening foods. It doesn't, um, it, the, the calories get shifted because of the, your, your, your brain's desire and, and, and needs. That said, it also has caffeine, which um, can't be great for you, but then again, you know, look at, we have this booming industry of, of uh, caffeine, caffeine shots that people take all the time. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a classic, like I said, I, I used to be a Platonist in my worldview. I'm much more Aristotelian now. Um, uh, there, there was a, a politician which was, ran uh, John Hightower, Jim Hightower, I think it was in California. No, in Texas for attorney general many years ago, 25 years ago. And um, some people criticized him because they said he was... Um, he was not moderate enough. He was too left. Um, and he says, the only thing, the only thing that's good in the middle of the road are, um, uh, right wing politicians and, and, uh, or, or unsuccessful politicians and dead armadillos. And not, I'm not about to be a dead armadillo. Um, that said, I think I've, uh, I, I play in the, the dead armadillo lane these days and I'm looking for solutions. I don't care if they come from the left or the right. How did uh, Plato and Aristotle differ on diet soda? That's a good question. I'll, I guess I'll have to go to the, um, uh, the world uh, resource for that and Google it, you know. But, but wait, you said you used to be a Platonist with regard to diet soda, and then you became an Aristotelian with regard to diet soda, okay. and I, my, I don't understand. Oh, my, my point is, is that I, I think everything in moderation. Aristotle so that's about Aristotle said everything in moderation? That, that's his basic viewpoint. Right. He, he, he really believed that, um, that, yeah, a more moderate way of looking at things tends, t tends to be um, a more successful way. And it was something in my more radical youth, I believe that uh, I didn't believe that so much. And even now, I believe every once in a while, social change is only going to happen when you push the margins. But generally speaking, I'm just a great believer in diversity and dialogue. And that comes from being willing to see the world through your enemies, who you think are your ideological enemies viewpoint and undermine them if you don't agree with them by actually acknowledging what parts of their argument carry some real weight. Don't, don't be a rejectionist. Don't throw everything out the window just because you're someone you don't respect um, espouses a, a, a perspective. How did the Genetic Literacy Project deal with COVID? Well, we've been. Um, our focus is on disinformation, not just on information. So we're not report, reporting on the G Wiz latest development, um, although we did talk a lot about it. But we really got into the anti-vaccination movement, denialism about um, uh, how to deal with uh, containment issues, anything where there was a bubbling controversy in among scientists or in the press. That was our sweet spot, and. It's, it's been an enormously beneficial in increasing the visibility of our site. Um, it's been actually a fun ride. Um, and uh, the whole anti-vaccine movement. I remember um, I, I was in a number of meetings last May or June, right, when they were talking about, oh, you know, vaccines could actually happen. We're funding these. There's some early research showing it's good. And I was telling my friends um, uh, and, and people in policy circles, you wait, there's going to be a huge percentage of the American population, upwards of 20%, maybe as high as 40% who aren't going to get vaccinated. They say, that's ridiculous. There's not, it's not that hard. I said, I know the anti-vaccination movement it, and it, right now it's liberal. And I even said it, that now, that it, but it's going to become associated with political divisions and it's going to become conservative and it's going to be out there and they're going to people who are going to reject it. And they poo-pooed me. And I, even some of those people have come back and said, you were, you were totally right. I didn't anticipate how rejectionist a large segment of the American population um, was going to be. So I, I think overall, we've never had so little trust in our leading institutions. I, I think that's what surveys show, that there's been a steady decline in trust in institutions such as big pharma, big agriculture, the politicians, uh, the academy, uh, the, the news media. So do you agree that, that 
in your lifetime, we've, we've never had so little trust in, by the general public in our elite institutions. And if so, is this a problem? And do you have any solutions? Um, I totally agree with you. It is a problem. Um, and I fear that it will get worse rather than better. I, I, um, I would like to think that this is a phase that we're going through. But I think, uh, unfortunately, social media and the balkanization of ideas that it's created, that, that, that uh, even the smallest opinion could have a fairly influential following um, means that this will continue. I don't see, I, I, don't, I don't see this as a phase we're going through and that, and that we're gonna snap back into this era of comedy, C-O-M-I-T-Y and, um, and, 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 um, and negotiation. I think it'll become increasingly balkanized and I don't want, I, I fear that we're gonna become Europe. Um, I, I do like a two party system. I think it forces people to the middle and to, and to accommodate. But I think um, be, because both of the parties have, have, uh, have moved to their respective edges that it will ultimately breed a three and four party system. I know that sounds impossible because we have 200 years of history where that's only happened a few times and it's always disappeared. I, 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 I cannot imagine we were going to get through the 30s, um, or get through the, the 2020s without a serious, fairly permanent third or maybe fourth party develop. Well, I think during COVID, we've we've lessened trust. I think Americans, during, due to the COVID experience, are going to have less trust in government, less trust in the CDC, less trust in the FDA, less trust in the media, less trust in our politicians. And here's, here's my tiny little solution for a way back, that if you're in an elite position and you come forward with a public statement, you try to place it in proper context of how much you know. So instead of saying we're going to govern according to science, I mean, science is so huge and, and amorphous, you say, okay, based on the following studies, uh, I recommend that people wear a face mask, though, to, to be honest, we don't know this much, and there are these contrary points of view, and uh, I think that there needs to be more full disclosure on the part of the elites, and to come forward more openly and honestly with the basis for why they're making these proclamations, and then when they change their mind, come forward and be open and honest, say, okay, I, three months ago, I made a proclamation that you should not wear face masks. Now I am saying something different. Here's the reasons that I'm saying something different. So do you have any thoughts on, on healing the, the distrust between regular Americans and the elites? Yeah, I, I wish it was as easy as, and I don't think, I'm not criticizing you, but it's not as easy as you sort of sketch it out to be um, because there's a vested interest just to use the example that you said, where Fauci got it wrong in the beginning, clearly, um, he did reverse himself a couple of months later. Um, but but now that's become political fodder for the far right or the Trumpian right, I would call it. it's not far right necessarily the Trumpian right, because it is in their interest to um, demonize Fauci because he's so closely now associated with the Biden administration. So it'll, it'll yield to dividends for Trumpian Republicans and Republicans in general, who also are doing it, even mainstream Republicans who wouldn't necessarily call them Trumpian. So the incentives are out of whack and I don't, I don't see any way those incentives will get back in whack. Um, I, I think that we are hopelessly balkanized and I, um, I don't see a road back. Uh, I don't mean to sound too pessimistic, um, but I just don't see it. But what if the president of the United States in an analogous situation in the future said, we don't know very much about this current situation, um, our history with what seems to be this type of uh, pandemic is that uh, these measures w may, may very well work. We have um, experts who are telling us different things. Uh, wh what do you think about that sort of approach to to make some kind of uh, what do you think of that approach versus the approach that we got during COVID, where you'd get these pronouncements as though it was God speaking to us? This is the science. Yeah, it, it happened on both sides. It, yeah. it happened on on the, on the, on the, the so-called COVID scientists from 
whether it was from the CDC or, 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 or the critics of the CDC and the administration, it also, of course, came from Trump. I, I think that that's, that that's would be a wise, nuanced president. And I actually think it would gain a lot of credibility if they had the personality to pull that off. Um, I think Biden would want to, wants to do that. I don't think he's the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, he never was, I thought he was a very mediocre senator all those years. And I think he is uh, a very well-meaning person. I think he has those emotional instincts, but he's not an articulate guy. And I don't think he's going to be capable. And, it's, and, and he's been too politicized already by a combination of his diehard opponents and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a handful of missteps. So, um, yeah, that, that would be a dream leader. Um, can that kind of person even get elected today? I don't know. Would, 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 would the Democrats nominate someone who's to talk like that? With, with the with with the with the Trumpian Republican Party, nominate someone who who doesn't salute Trumpian ideology. I don't think the answer to both of those is no. So I that's why I don't at this point I don't see much um, any transcendent figures. It would have to be a very a very interesting personality who could um, who could think out of the box and 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 really capture people. But that, the danger of that is that usually you find that in, in demagogues, <laughs> some people who are just rhetorically brilliant and um, uh, but have 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 the convey the illusion of of, uh, of mindfulness. So I don't know. I, I, I sound discouraged because I am discouraged. What what is science as as it is used in in the news media as we hear it on on CNN or Fox like follow the science. What the heck? What is science? Yeah, science is not a uh, science is not a set of answers. Science is a set of questions. Science is the way you approach things. People don't understand. They think when they say science that people use use the term to mean facts, and what it really should be is a term to describe the process of evaluating things. It's evidence based, and new evidence comes along, and if it challenges it, you suddenly. Um, uh, put put the FOK box around a set of conclusions, and as the evidence um, uh, increases, you either abandon that idea and adopt another one, or you get more fully invested in, in, in a certain conclusion. Science is a methodology of inquiry. It's not a set of facts. And until people understand that when you say you believe in science, what you believe is in evidence-based thinking, and that's a whole lot different from what other people um, mean when they say science, they believe you believe in my facts, and that's not what it is. In what in what social context does the phrase "we need to follow the science" have meaning? None. I mean, in other words, I think it's used as you have to follow what I'm telling you. That's what that's the way it's used. Follow the science means you have to be open to new evidence, and um, and that's not that's not the way it's mostly used. Uh, either by the media or, frankly, by a lot of officials that talk about it. I mean, from the beginning, if some people had talked the way you described what a wise politician would say, I think that, that whoever that person was would have enormous public sway in dampening down concerns and uh, tiptoeing us towards, you know, embraceable solutions. Do you think uh, big tech should should try to squelch, say, anti-vaccine opinions? Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I, I've we, we've seen some of our news-minded posts censored on Facebook, for instance, when they're really benign. And frankly, if someone had, if someone other than a uh, a a a, uh, a bot trained by the algorithms generated by um, a large corporation, um, uh, you know, it, it was, it's, it's censorship. So, uh, I, I'm a mixed minds about this. I definitely believe that, um, that there are things that are, that are dangerous. I think the internet is a purveyor of disinformation, but it's also an impossible place to, um, not only to, um, to police, but by its very nature, it's horribly selective and will reflect the values and the ideology of the people doing the policing. So I would err on the side of the same reason, you know, I support the ACLU. I'll err on the side of, of, of having speech that I don't like 
um, as a way to preserve speech that I think is really empowering to people. So yes, I think it's gone too far. Um, do we have to draw, uh, could we be willing to draw lines somewhere? Yeah. And I sympathize, empathize actually with, um, with, you know, corporations that control Facebook or Twitter in that they're feeling like they want to be responsible. Um, where you draw that line is, uh, I, I'm thankful I don't have to make that decision. Uh, maybe well, you do for your, your operation. I mean, you draw lines all the time, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I said, I, I, I put on our site what I, what I want, what we as a staff want to put on the site. So I won't, uh, well, I won't put on things that I determine, that we determine, because I'm not the only one making the decision, that we determine is drivel um, or dangerous. Um, did, did we put on a lot of things questioning the origins of the COVID vaccine? We have. Do we, have we put on things that question um, the, the uh, left-wing criticism of the Trump administration? We did. Um, did we put in things critical of some of the outrageous things that Trump perpetrated on a regular basis, we did. And so that, that I guess our way of dealing with it, it's kind of maybe a Clinton, Bill Clinton triangulation strategy is if you put what you think is the most thoughtful things from perspective, different perspectives, some of which you don't fully agree with, then, then, then you're creating the conversation that you hope for and you hope for the best. Let me think for a second. I had this brilliant question. Oh, yes. What are you intellectually excited about these days? Sorry, it's probably my daughter calling. I don't know who it is. It's probably a scam call. What, uh, what, are you, what are you excited about these days? Intellectually excited? What's, what's compelling your attention? What are you eager to know more about? What's, what's driving you? What, what gets you powering through the day on an intellectual basis? As discouraged as I am by the divisiveness and balkanization of public discourse um, in the United States, I am ultimately a bridge builder and I am excited about educating to the best of my ability people to open their minds to out of the box solutions to a wide range of things, because I'm less interested in whether you're applying it to GMO foods or vaccines, but I, I, I consider my, what most excites me is teaching people how to think differently and to try on unconventional ideas in a respectful and open way. Like that's why I said I was excited to, 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 to stumble on Quillette about a year ago, a year and a half ago, it'd been around for quite a, three or four years, but I didn't know about it. And suddenly I feel, oh my God, I feel like I'm back in college again and I'm challenging my, my intellectual status quo. And um, I, I just am convinced that the more you can open up people's eyes to think out of their rigid, narrow lanes, the more hope you have um, in challenging some of the intractable problems that we have. So in essence, despite the fact I was espousing pessimism, I'm a um, I'm excited about the world of ideas and the ability of ideas um, to inspire and change. What's the last book that got you excited? The last what? The last book that you read that got you excited. Oh, I'm reading, I'm in a book club. I'm, uh, I'm reading a book right now about um, telling the story of uh, a parallel story of families uh, split by um, the wall going up in East Germany uh, between you know, the East Germans and the West Germans and families uh, that evolved on the East side and the West side. Um, and it, it's an amazing story of the dangers of, um, of in that case, far left thinking, because the, that's what East Germany was. It was the left gone wild. And it was, it was both um, apropos for what we're experiencing today um, in terms of the division between leftist thinking and, and, um, and, and, and right-wing thinking, but it also was hopeful because what came through was this incredible humanity um, uh, that existed from people from incredibly diverse ideologies. And it, it was, it, it is very hopeful reading that book that that human connection can help us overcome 
um, the divisiveness spread by ideological autocracy. Are there any academics who you're excited about these days? You just stumbled on their paper or you just happen to have a conversation with one? I, li I, I like Michael Shermer always. He's the, um, he's the founder, editor, publisher of uh, Skeptic Magazine. I always love their out-of-the-box thinking. So that's a, a person I, I respect. Um, and I and just open to, um, to, to, to people willing to challenge hegemonic thinking. I like ideas. Um, it gets me excited and it makes me believe that the world can change. Have you tried smart drugs, modafinil, Ritalin or whatever? No, nothing. Hey, I'm not, that, that doesn't intrigue you? I mean, I'm sure you've tried caffeine. I have. I have not tried. I'm not really, I mean, I, you know, my, I've got a 22 year old daughter, so I, I can't not be uh, exposed to the cannabis generation and, uh, and, and still dabble in, uh, in, in that very sporadically, but um, not, certainly not against it. But no, I'm, um, I, I have a very good friend of mine who's a psychiatrist. He's in my book club and he is, um, uh, he's become intrigued with psilocybin and, and uh, mind expanding drugs, even though he's never taken any serious drugs in his life. And so he's, he's been doing reading in preparation for, uh, for going on some uh, uh, journeys like that. I mean, I'm all for it. I'll be happy to hear his, um, what comes of it, but I, I guess I'm not inclined to do something like that myself. Oh, do you drink coffee? Not much, not really. I usually drink decaf coffee when I have it. I'm a, I'm a, I like to drink English breakfast tea in the morning, um, or sometimes I drink hot apple cider. Those are my morning, morning treats. So some people talk about a, a cup of caffeinated coffee as a cup of optimism. What, what effect does a cup of fully caffeinated coffee have on you, if any? Well, I, I, the reason, I think the reason I like Diet Coke, besides the fact I'm addicted to its metallic taste, um, is uh, I, I do get a, a caffeine boost from it. I don't mind that. It, it does. Uh, I sometimes hit a lull, like a lot of us do in the biorhythms of the late afternoon. And uh, uh, when I want to generate a couple of hours of more productive work, I'll uh, drink a little Diet Coke. But you've never thought of trying something like modafinil? No. Or Adderall? No, that, that just doesn't interest you? I'm not saying it's, it's just not something I thought much about. You know, now that you're raising it, I'll probably do a little research to um, spark my curiosity. But um, I didn't, I didn't, haven't really uh, thought much about it, or thought at all about it, actually. Yeah, because when I, I went on Modafinil, I went from, you know, eight good cognitive hours a day to 15 good cognitive hours a day. So for me, it was, it was life changing. But that's just my thing. Um, what should I ask you that I have not asked you? I think you've covered it at all. I don't <laughs> I, I hope you'll cut this down to the 12 minutes it deserves. Because um, <laughs> it's a lot, you know, we've gone on for quite a long time. I don't think I'm not gonna tell you how to do your business for sure. But that people would um, I'm not that interesting. I mean, I think I have some, I, I think I reflect certain trends in journalism and critical thinking that a lot of people are carrying that torch these days. And I would like to be seen as part of that movement um, rather than some, you know. Um, you're not I, a guru? Are you telling us you're not a guru? Yeah, I hope the, my daughter would definitely say I'm not a guru. I could tell you that. She, she gets the final vote on all these things. So, <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for your time, John Entine. Thank you very much.